Okay, folks, let's get started. You ready to go? Our old nemesis is back already. Your nemesis is back. Oh, the bounce. I thought you were talking about me. <laughs> we're off to a great start. That You see on the screen, you're looking at the class schedule for winter of 2011. And that's because I don't have the URL with me for 2012. That was kind of dumb. But it's the same basic content. The picture figures may be slightly different for because uh, it's volume six of the textbook book. But I think you'll, we'll, we'll get through it. Anyway, I'll get it fixed for next time. A um, couple things. Uh, first of all, I hope everybody had a good break. Yes. Too long. How many of you bro have broken all of your New Year's resolutions already? Nobody has? Wow. How many of you made New Year's resolutions? Oh, all right, so a few, a few. I find New Year's resolutions are good. They make you feel good when you make them, right? After that, well, you know, but you feel, I'm going to, this year, I'm going to, by golly, I'm going to win that Nobel Prize, right? Drop those 28 pounds that I gained over Christmas. All right, so uh, welcome to BB451. For those of you who were not in 450 last term, uh, I'm sure you've heard the horror stories. Uh, but if not, I will try to make it as unpleasant for you as I can. Um, everything uh, in the class is online. Um, when I get the correct URL for you, I'll email it to the class. Uh, I change it every year so, because I have to sort of manipulate a page. And then I, for, I didn't realize I didn't have it with me, but I don't have it with me. Uh, at that page, uh, in fact, if you go back to this page here, that'll get you the right stuff. That is um, this page, just instruction slash BB451. That'll get you the syllabus. And the syllabus, as people know, is required reading for the, for the course. And so it's important to uh, get that syllabus and read through it, make sure you know what's in it. And uh, everything I do is, is up here on screen. So I will make um, videos available. I videotape my lectures, and I try to get them posted within about 24 hours after I've given the lecture so that you can access those. And uh, you will see them on a page that looks very much like this one, where you can see videos, and you'll click to the links, et cetera, and get all that. Um, I don't keep specific office hours uh, because I'm in my office a lot. That may be changing slightly this term, so I may post some specific office hours. But as always, you're always welcome to come to my office. And if I'm free, I'm, I, you're, I, you have priorities. So I, I will not uh, be unavailable to you as much as I can. If you want to schedule an appointment with me, please feel free to send me an email, and I'll be happy to schedule something with you. And uh, if you need a tutor, or other assistance of any sort, then of course let me know. And I have some excellent students who tutor in biochemistry. Yes, sir. There's the URL. Oh. Excellent. Oh, wow. Okay. I guess it makes a difference if you put winter 12 there, doesn't it? And schedule. I did remember it right. I just forgot that winter 12 thing. Okay. Oh, what did I do? That was cool. Um, go back here. Winter 12 and schedule 451 CW12. That's what I thought. Okay. W12. Excellent. Now we're up to date. Thank you much. Appreciate that. He's going to get an A. I should probably get an F for not having the URL with me. That was kind of dumb, wasn't it? All right. Uh, Okay, so what we're going to see this term, uh, this term is an interesting term because it, we sort of continue the metabolic processes that we started last term. And I think with this term, what you can see in metabolism is the sort of beautiful way in which these processes relating to energy are integrated with each other. And you will understand a lot more as we go through this, how your body works. You started to see that last term with respect to glucose metabolism. You're going to see it a lot more with respect to the citric acid cycle, uh, electron transport, and oxidative phosphorylation. And you will, we will talk for the first time about respiratory control. And it's at that point that I think students really begin to get that real uh, appreciation of the beauty of metabolism. Metabolism is not simply a matter of memorizing a bunch of reactions and enzymes and so forth, although there is uh, obviously uh, a component of that in, in what we do. But the big picture of metabolism is a very important thing, and it's really a very interesting story. We talk about metabolism essentially for the first half of the uh, term. 
The second half of the term, uh, we uh, go through molecular biology. And so we get up close and personal with DNA replication, transcription, and translation. And we'll be going at, through this in more depth than what you've seen in your other courses that you've had uh, for the most part. Um, I talk fast. I know that. If I get talking too fast, as always, Kevin, slow down or repeat this, et cetera, and I'll be happy to uh, try to uh, accommodate you as best I can. Okay. Um, before we get started, any comments, questions, requests? Yes? How was your holiday? How was my holiday? Thank you for asking. Uh, there's another A. Uh, my holiday was very good. Uh, like everybody else, I liked the length of the holiday. It was wonderful. Um, I went and visited my mother in Oklahoma, and the main good thing about going to Oklahoma is you really appreciate coming back to Oregon. Uh, so, <laughs> oh boy, I'll be in trouble now. <laughs> YouTube, all the Oklahomans will get me here. Uh, I had a, had a great time, uh, and uh, mainly I got caught up. I had a ton of work to do, but I actually feel like for the first time in a long time that I got, I got on top of a bunch of things. So that was very good. So happy to be back. It's always, to me, exciting, the first day of class, and it's always exciting to get back in front of people and get going through biochemistry. So I really love that. I really love this interaction. And for me, this is also really a special pleasure because... Um, I get to, you know, carry over with a class that I worked with last term. So I know what you guys have heard and what you're supposed to know. Um, and I can actually build on the things that I talked about last term. And so that's uh, a nice connection for me. I find that by the end of this term, I've gotten to know a decent number of you uh, fairly well. And I, I, I very much enjoy that. And yes, we'll have a song or two this term. Yeah. What's your uh, New Year's resolution? My New Year's resolution. Thank you for asking. Uh, as a matter of fact, my New Year's resolution is to run further than I ran last year. Last year I finished up with, I think it was 1320K, and this year uh, I'm hoping to do 1500K. So if any of you are interested in running and you want to run in the morning, give me a holler. I'm always looking for runners, and uh, it's fun. I'm slow. I'm not fast. And, but I can speed up or slow down according to who I'm running with a little bit, within limits. We keep talking about this. We don't have to talk about biochemistry. This would be good, right? So Connie... Can you pick up your final? The finals are available in the BB office, and there's a key posted outside of my door. Okay. Yes? What was average on the final? Average on the final was about 100 out of 150. It's about 66%. Yeah. It's about 66%. So it was a little bit lower than uh, what there was on the, I think, second exam, but it was uh, still not a, bad, not a bad overall performance. Yes, sir? Are those still available for review? Like uh, for reconsideration on questions? If there's errors, yes. yes. Okay. okay. Um, so much for all the pleasantries. Now we get to dive into biochemistry, huh? What's the ribbons for? Anybody know what the ribbons are for? I want to screw up the universe here. I don't know. What will happen? <laughs> They'll probably come cut my arm off. Or all those Oklahomans will come get me or something. All right. Well, um... We're going to talk uh, about a really interesting process you've heard about in other classes. And what you probably haven't gotten is you haven't gotten that integration of this process, the citric acid cycle, with respect to other metabolic pathways. And that's one of the things I'm going to hammer home to you is that integration. And it's not complicated, uh, but it's not really gone over very well in other classes in my experience. So let's start there. The citric acid cycle is... Uh, another cycle or another metabolic process that we refer to as a central metabolic process, meaning that it is central to the metabolism of virtually every cell. Okay? There are no absolutes uh, with respect to metabolism, but it's pretty darn central to, to most cells. And that by most, it's probably 99.9% .9 of cells have uh, a, a completely functional citric acid cycle. The process is a cycle. It goes like a wheel. We start at one place and we end up at that same place. And that is um, an important consideration in uh, understanding the citric acid cycle. Okay? As, we will, as you will see, we can really break it into two main uh, components. Um, two components, the first component being the um, oxidation of, or the decarboxylation. Oh, come on, now we're not going to do this, are we? Um, I guess we are. Hit it. Uh, 
All right. The decarboxylation, which you see of the two CO2s there, um, of a six-carbon intermediate, and then the other half of the cycle is rearranging the four-carbon intermediate that re the results from that back into the starting four-carbon intermediate. So even though it's a cycle or a circle, we do think about it having a starting point and an ending point, which are the same. And we'll see how that goes uh, in just a bit. The uh, cycle is uh, interesting in that it is one of the major uh, oxidative cycles of the cell. That's shown in the part at the bottom with the eight electrons. The eight electrons mean that we make four reduced electron carriers, three NADHs and one FADH2. We also produce, uh, with each turn of the cycle, one triphosphate, and that triphosphate is GTP. Okay? Yes, ma'am? What were the electrons again? Uh, there's three NADHs and one FADH2. There we go. Okay? Now, um, I'm going to go through some detail with those uh, in a bit. Now, before, and I emphasize this, before we talk about the electron, uh, before we talk about the um, citric acid cycle, we have to talk about how things get to the citric acid cycle. Okay? Now, it turns out there's many ways for compounds to get into the citric acid cycle. We're going to focus on one way to start, and that one way to start is the entry of a two-carbon intermediate known as acetyl-CoA. You've heard about acetyl-CoA. We talked about it last term. And it is, for our purposes right now, the primary entry point uh, into the citric acid cycle. This shows the cycle in a little bit more detail. You can see um, what we think of as a starting material, uh, for our purposes right now, is oxaloacetate. We, we talked about that last term as well. Oxaloacetate has four carbons. We combine a two-carbon piece with it. A two-carbon piece is acetyl-CoA. That makes a six-carbon piece. We have two decarboxylations. That's those two CO2s that you saw lost before. That gives us a four-carbon piece. And then the rest of the cycle is rearranging that back into the original four-carbon piece. So in a nutshell, that's what's happening in the citric acid cycle. OK. Now, as I said, we can't talk about the citric acid cycle until we talk about how we get material into it. Okay? So I'm going, to, I'm going to hold off on the citric acid cycle for just a bit today, and I tell you about how it is that our cells, or one way that it is that our cells make acetyl-CoA. And in doing so, we're actually linking the citric acid cycle to glycolysis. Okay? So glycolysis, if you recall, at the end of last term, I know that was a long time ago, but if you recall from glycolysis, what happens is that the uh, end product of glycolysis was pyruvate, and pyruvate, in, the, uh, in, in order to get it into the citric acid cycle, has to be oxidized. So that's our entry point to get things into the citric acid cycle. What I'm telling you here is not a part of the citric acid cycle. It's only how we get things to make acetyl-CoA. OK. Blah, 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 blah. All right, schematically it looks like this. So what I'm getting ready to tell you is up here, you'll notice that up here is not a part of the citric acid cycle. So don't confuse what I'm getting ready to tell you with the citric acid cycle because it's not a part of it. The entry of carbons from glucose into the citric acid cycle requires an enzyme that has a couple of names. Okay? And I think your book is not consistent in how it deals with those names, so I'm going to try to be consistent in how I deal with those names. There's acetyl-CoA, and the relevant part of this guy is the red right there, okay? All this big handle is used simply to carry this little guy right here. All right. Well, that little guy right there is of a lot of interest to us because we have to uh, make it in order to be able to get those carbons to use for energy. The enzyme that's used to break pyruvate down into acetyl-CoA is known as pyruvate dehydrogenase. Now, your book is inconsistent in the way it, describes, it uses that name. I'll tell you why as I get going along. But the name of the enzyme that catalyzes the conversion of pyruvate into acetyl-CoA is known as pyruvate dehydrogenase. Okay? It's an interesting and it's a slightly complicated enzyme. 
This is an electron micrograph showing the appearance of this enzyme. And you can see this enzyme looks a little bit like dice, right? It's cubic in nature, and it has uh, some sort of bumps or balls that correspond to individual subunits of the enzyme, all right? Um, that right there is a little bit more clear depiction of that. You're not going to have to draw that, so don't worry about that. But I'm just showing you what you're seeing in that electron micrograph. Okay? There are three primary subunits that, are, uh, that comprise this enzyme. Your book has very long names for them, and we're going to keep them very simple. We're going to call them E1, E2, and E3. Okay? E1, E2, and E3. As we will see, these have individual functions, and we will talk individually about those. Okay? There's the mouthful names that are there. And you can see already that the book has gotten off on the wrong foot by giving it this name, pyruvate dehydrogenase component. Okay? Most people call this subunit pyruvate decarboxylase. Now that's confusing because this enzyme is overall catalyzing a decarboxylation. But as we will see, the decarboxylation is only one part of what this enzyme does. So E1 is pyruvate decarboxylation. You're not even going to need to know that. If you know it as E1, E2, E3, I'm happy. Okay? But each of these subunits has a function. And as I talk about the mechanism of the enzyme, I'm going to show you those functions. Look at the number of these chains that are in there. 24 in E1, 24 in E2, 12 in E3. It's no wonder it's big enough we can see it in an electron microscope. This is a pretty big honking enzyme. What we're going to focus on for the most part are coenzymes that this enzyme uses. Okay? Coenzymes. There are five coenzymes that this enzyme uses. I'm going to give you the coenzymes first. And then as we go through the mechanism, I'll point out to you where they're used. All right? The five coenzymes, you can see two of them on the screen. Thiamine pyrophosphate, which you are welcome to call TPP. And lipoic acid, which I will also let you call lipoamide. When it's linked to one of the proteins, it's called lipoamide. When it's free, it's called lipoic acid. But I'll, use, I'll let you use either one of those terms. Lipoamide, L-I-P-O-A-M-I-D-E. Okay? I said there are five, okay? The third coenzyme is coenzyme A. When we talk about acetyl-CoA, it's the CoA part that we're talking about. So the third coenzyme is coenzyme A, or you can also call it CoA. Sometimes we write CoA as... C-O-A-S-H, and we'll see why that's the case in just a bit. The fourth coenzyme is NAD, and the fifth coenzyme is FAD. So we have two coenzymes involved in oxidation reduction. They're both essential. They're both important. So those five coenzymes allow the decarboxylation of pyruvate to occur, and the oxidation reactions to also occur. I'm sorry? So, uh, uh, repeat the, 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 what the five coenzymes do? The last sentence. If I remember the last sentence. <laughs> uh, okay, so the last sentence um, was that these five coenzymes allow the decarboxylation to occur and the oxidation reactions to occur. I think that was the last, end, last sentence. At my age, you can't remember things. You know, you can remember something that happened back when you were about 14, but you can't remember what you said two minutes ago. So I think the same thing happens when you take an exam, right? You can't remember what... Yeah. It's a sign of old age, folks. Okay. Well, I haven't, I've been talking that I will tell you about mechanism. I haven't done that, so let's now overview the mechanism. It's not going to be the mechanism that we talked about with respect to um, the um, uh, serine protease, so don't worry about that. In fact, this is probably going to be as deep of a mechanism as you're going to see this term right here. Let's look, first of all, at what's happening in this process. Pyruvate is getting converted from a three-carbon compound into a two-carbon compound linked to a CoA. 
So we're going from pyruvate over here on the left to acetyl group linked to a CoA on the right. That means we have to lose a carbon in the process. And that carbon that we're losing is lost in the very first step. The very first step. We can think of the decarboxylation. This is where E1 is important. E1 is essential for the decarboxylation. Now, this, is, this decarboxylation is really interesting because you will notice that the decarboxylation is not directly linked to an oxidation. The oxidation follows in a subsequent step. Okay? So the decarboxylation is not the oxidation step. It's a step that's independent of that. And that turns out to have some very big importance. In our cells, we automatically go from decarboxylation to oxidation to transfer. We don't have any way of short-circuiting this. If we had a way of short-circuiting this, we would save an awful lot of money on happy hour. Okay? Why? Because bacteria and yeast, one of the ways in which they ferment is they short-circuit. Instead of going through the oxidation step, they take this guy here and make ethanol. We can't do that. Okay? So yes, sir? Does E1 stabilize that tertiary carbanion that's formed since that's a pretty unstable species? Uh, no, E1 does not stabilize that. TPP actually stabilizes that. And I'll talk about that. Okay? TPP is a part of the E1, but E1 itself, no. Okay? This is where the coenzymes are very, very important in that stabilization process. Okay, now, looking at this mechanism, we've got carbon dioxide produced, we've got E1 that's catalyzed it, and as noted up here, this guy right here is a very unstable species. We don't want it floating around, and we don't have it floating around. In fact, in our cells, we never have it floating around. Okay? This is what's called a, 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 a reactive acid aldehyde. Reactive acid aldehyde. Acid aldehyde we talked about last term. Why did we talk about acid aldehyde last term? Hangovers. Very good. The one thing you remember from last term, right? Hangovers. All right. So a reactive acid aldehyde basically has extra electrons here. Okay? We've got to deal with this guy. We don't have that being free. We don't want this reacting. So in fact, upon decarboxylation, this guy is transferred to thiamine pyrophosphate, TPP. That's why that first coenzyme is necessary. It's actually carried, TPP carries and hangs on to this guy. Okay? Now, the next step of the process is where oxidation occurs. What's happening in the next step of the process? What we are making in the next step of the process is we are transferring this guy right here, this reactive guy right here, from TPP to lipoic acid. So this oxidation occurs during the transfer to the lipoic acid or the lipoamide. What's happening in that process? Well, we see electrons being lost. We see a minus here. We see plus over here. Okay? Loss of two electrons are occurring. And what's happening in that process is that if you look at that structure of lipoic acid that I show you, showed you, you will see that lipoic acid has a disulfide bond, two sulfurs linked together. In this process, what's happening is that disulfide bond is getting reduced because it's accepting the electrons from this activated intermediate. That leaves two sulfhydryl groups. I'll show you this in a second also. And it results in the oxidation of this compound right here. All right. Now, last, and I'm going to show you these things separately also. Last, this oxidized acetate, as it were, is transferred to coenzyme A. Okay? It's transferred to coenzyme A. That's occurring on E3. So we can think of this as E1, E2, E3. Okay? E1, E2, E3. Now, E2 has some other things going on with it, as we shall see, 
that are important to understand the overall process. If we simply did this right here, we would have problems because we haven't accounted for what's happening to these electrons. Okay? If we simply left that lipoamide in the reduced state, we couldn't do another cycle of decarboxylation. All right? Well, let's look to see now at individual reactions what's happening. Here is that initial decarboxylation reaction. The decarboxylation reaction actually results directly in the attachment of that hydroxyethyl TPP right there, where we've linked, up, we've linked this red portion of the molecule to this ring right here. Okay? The CO2 has been lost. All right, there's a mechanism. We're not going to go through the mechanism. Don't sweat that. Okay, then we transfer this guy right here which is this reduced intermediate to lipoamide, and look what's happening to lipoamide. We're breaking the disulfide bond. When we add electrons to a disulfide bond, we create sulfhydryl bonds. There's an SH, and as we will see, this will become an SH as well. Okay, and then we transfer this guy over to a CoA, and now we're left with two to uh, sulfhydryl bonds. It's this structure that we have to resolve. We have to get this guy back to the disulfide state if we want to have this enzyme continue its reaction. That happens as a result of transfer of electrons from the lipoamide residue to FAD. That converts FAD into FADH2. It also regenerates the lipoamide. In addition, excuse me, <coughs> the electrons from FADH2 are transferred to NAD, creating an NADH and resulting in FAD. Ultimately, the electrons from NADH will be dumped into the electron transport system and we'll, we, we will regenerate NAD. Okay? But in terms of this enzyme, this is an ending point right here because we've regenerated the lipoamide disulfide bond and the enzyme is ready for another cycle of catalysis. Okay, that's a mouthful. I'm going through it quickly. Questions? Off to a great start, aren't we? You guys look asleep. Yes, question back there. E1, E2, and E3 are providing active sites for this reaction to occur. That's correct. The stabilization is really more, I would describe more as being done by the coenzymes themselves. Yes. But they're components of E1, E2, and E3. Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. So NAD NAD takes both electrons from FADH2. Yep. Virtually every transfer of electrons, we will see this term, are... Uh, occurring in pairs. Virtually everything we'll see with electron transfer is electron transfer occurring in pairs. Okay. Now, that's just a blah, 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 blah. As I said, this reaction in us, once we start with pyruvate, we have to go all the way through to the end. We can't short circuit. Bacteria and yeast can short circuit. And if you think back to last term when I talked about the different fates of pyruvate, one of the fates of pyruvate in animals, if we didn't have oxygen, was that we could convert it to lactate, right? If you think of the thing I showed you for yeast and bacteria, one of the fates was that pyruvate went to ethanol. Now you know how it goes to ethanol. Because acetaldehyde can be reduced to ethanol by NADH. That regenerates NAD, and that's necessary for what cycle or what process? Wire, wire cells going through fermentation? They're anaerobic, but why, what are they trying to do? What are they trying to keep going? Glycolysis. glycolysis. They're trying to keep glycolysis going because glycolysis needs that NAD. If there's no oxygen, the only way to make NAD is by this process right here. That's why bacteria and yeast are making ethanol so they can keep glycolysis going. That's why we make lactic acid so we can keep glycolysis going. If we stop glycolysis, we're going to be in trouble. Okay. 
There's the poamide. It's called the poamide when it's connected to the protein. It's actually connected through a lysine bond uh, in the protein. There's the structure. And there's, if that's helpful to you, I'm not going to expect you to re regurgitate this, but uh, this, this cycle right here anyway. Uh, but you should know the basics of the cycle. I would certainly say that you should know the, that initial basic diagram that I showed you, those three steps where E1, E2, and E3 play a role. You should certainly know the functions of the coenzymes in this process. Now, this process that you see here is all occurring inside of the mitochondrion. Inside of the mitochondrion. In fact, we're going to spend a fair amount of time inside the mitochondrion because that's where the citric acid cycle occurs. That's also where fatty acid oxidation occurs. So these processes are occurring gesundheit, in the citric acid cycle. OK. Yes? Very good question. Is it accurate to say it never lets go? And the answer is you're correct. It does not let go. It literally is passing them from one component to the next. And so they're not released in a free form because they are fairly reactive uh, intermediates. You, you got it. OK. That is the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. So uh, that went, I guess maybe I'm going fast today, so I should slow down. Give people a chance to catch their breath. Give me a chance to catch my breath. OK, enough of that. Now, that's a joke, folks. <clears throat> All right, let's talk about the citric acid cycle. So as I said, those reactions I've just described to you are not a part of the citric acid cycle, but now we are talking about reactions that are part of the citric acid cycle. The cycle is circular, as I noted. Technically, it doesn't have a starting and an end point, but we're going to define this for our purposes as a starting point. It will also become the ending point when oxaloacetate is eventually remade over here. Okay. Oxaloacetate, we saw that last term. Where did we see oxaloacetate last, last term? Anybody remember? Gluconeogenesis. And where was gluconeogenesis occurring? It's occurring in the liver. In the cell, where is it occurring? The first step occurs in the mitochondrion. Okay? The last step occurs in the endoplasmic reticulum. Everything else occurs in the cytoplasm. Why is that important? That's important because that's the first step of gluconeogenesis. What are we making? Exaloacetate. We see that exaloacetate can readily be made inside of the mitochondrion if it's needed. Oh, there's our friend. Yes, goodbye, friend friend that used that in a sarcastic nature. All right. Exaloacetate can be made in the mitochondrion very easily. Plenty of exaloacetate there. We will see exaloacetate is one of the most ubiquitous molecules to be found in metabolism. We see it in gluconeogenesis. We see it in the citric acid cycle. We see it in the metabolism of many amino acids. So it's a very, very interesting and important uh, compound. In this first step, we are taking that four-carbon exaloacetate and we are converting it into a six-carbon molecule known as citrate. I don't care if you know it as citrile-CoA. I never even refer to that myself at all. Exaloacetate, OAA. Acetyl-CoA, ACCOA. Goes to citrate. Now, this reaction is an energetically favorable reaction. In fact, it's fairly energetically favorable. The enzyme that catalyzes it, and by the way, I'm not going to require you to memorize all the structures of the citric acid cycle. Like last term, I will require you to know the names of all of the enzymes and the names of all the intermediates. You should also know how many carbons they have. Okay, but I'm not going to require you to know the structure. Okay, the name of the enzyme that catalyzes this reaction is called citrate synthase, S-Y-N-T-H-A-S-E. 
Very easy name. Synthase meaning synthesizes, right? It synthesizes citrate. Citrate synthase catalyzes this reaction. As I said, this reaction is energetically fairly favorable. That'll turn out to be important when we get to the other side of the citric acid cycle. Putting two molecules together isn't always a very favorable process, but this process is energetically fairly favorable. Why is this energetically fairly favorable? It's because it uses an activated intermediate. Anybody remember what that was from last term? What's an activated intermediate? Or give me an example of an activated intermediate you saw last term. Does anybody remember last term? Yes, over here. UDP glucose was an activated intermediate. Excellent. An activated intermediate, I will remind you since you look a little sleepy, is a molecule that has a high energy bond. You okay? Well, I just, I was thinking in my head, but I was way off of where it It has a high energy bond, and it uses the energy of that bond to donate a part of itself to something else. That's what an activated intermediate was. Last term, we saw UDP glucose had a high energy bond. It used the energy of that bond to put a glucose onto a growing glycogen chain. You probably don't remember, but I mentioned last time that acetyl-CoA is also an activated intermediate. This bond between the sulfur of the CoA and the acetyl group is a high energy bond. The energy of this bond is what makes this reaction favorable. Acetyl-CoA is an activated intermediate has high energy and uses the energy of itself to help put this two carbon piece onto this four carbon piece, thereby making citrate. Excuse me. Okay. Now, as I said, the energetic favorableness of this reaction is important as we come back around to the other side. Okay. In the second step of the process of uh, the citric acid cycle, the six carbon citrate intermediate is rearranged. It's rearranged to make an isocitrate. And that rearrangement, as you can see, simply moves a hydroxyl group from one position to another. Instead of being in the middle, it's moved to the top one, as you can see here. Okay. This is an isomerization, as it were. It's a rearrangement of the position of things relative to the molecule. And what the cell is getting ready to do is it's getting ready for the first oxidation. The enzyme that catalyzes this reaction is the only enzyme of the process whose name <coughs> excuse me, doesn't tell you what it does. The enzyme name is aconitase. And yes, it has that intermediate, but I don't even expect you're going to know the intermediate. I only care about the beginning and the end there. Aconitase catalyzes the conversion of citrate into isocitrate. Okay. We're still at six carbons. We started with six. All we've done is we rearranged the things around there to make uh, that new six carbon molecule. Have you still Acontase is right there. A C O N I T A S E. Okay. Now, the third step of the citric acid cycle involves the oxidation of isocitrate. It's catalyzed by an enzyme known as isocitrate dehydrogenase. Whenever you see, hear the word dehydrogenase in an enzyme, it is always an oxidation reaction that it catalyzes. Isocitrate dehydrogenase is catalyzing the oxidation of isocitrate, starting with the six carbon molecule, again, forget the intermediate, getting over here to a five carbon molecule, Alpha keto glutarate. Okay. Oxidation reactions release electrons. We don't want those electrons floating around. Electrons are taken by an electron carrier. In this case, the electron carrier is NAD, making NADH. You guys are looking a little tired. You need a song? You need a song? 
You want a song? Will you sing loud if I pull up a song? Yes. All right, we'll have a song. Now, <coughs> A, you've got to sing loud. B, I know that everybody's been very, very upset at the fact that it's been so dry lately, so I thought we would sing about that, okay? Anybody know the song, Let It Snow, Let It Snow, Let It Snow? Yes. All right, let's go with this one. Oh, the Oregon weather's dowdy, cause the sky is mostly cloudy. You can't stop it if you complain. So let it rain, let it rain, let it rain. It doesn't show signs of slowing, and it's rarely right for snowing. Though it's driving some folks insane. Let it rain, let it rain, let it rain. When it finally turns out dry, we'll be putting away our rain gear. It will probably be July, but I'll surely miss the reindeer. Cause the sound of the falling rain, patter pattering down the drain, make music inside my brain. So let it rain, let it rain, let it rain. All right. Woo. Oh. Don't encourage me. <clears throat> okay. Now that the blood's flowing, we can, we can go further in the citric acid cycle. How's that? Okay. Let's do one more reaction. And I'll tell you what. We'll actually finish early today. How's that? One more reaction. This re last reaction, I've saved the best for last because this is a cool reaction and it's an interesting reaction. Okay? You can see it on the screen here. Alpha ketoglutarate is going to get oxidized. There's an NAD. And there's a CoA, and it's going to get transferred, the four carbon product, to the CoA. It's catalyzed by, a reaction, by an enzyme known as alpha ketoglutarate. And by the way, you can call alpha ketoglutarate alpha KG if you want. Alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase. This also is a decarboxylation. It's also a decarboxylation, it's also an oxidation. We produce NADH as we produced before. And the energy of that oxidation is creating another activated intermediate. Look at this. Here's that S bond to the C. Succinyl-CoA, activated intermediate. Okay. Well, why is this a cool reaction? This is a cool reaction because this enzyme, alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase, which you can call alpha KGDH. Alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase has a structure that is almost people are noisy out there. Almost identical to pyruvate dehydrogenase. It's almost identical. Indeed, if we look at what it's doing, it's catalyzing a reaction almost identical to it. There's an alpha keto acid. Pyruvate is an alpha keto acid. In pyruvate oxidation, we see loss of the carbon off of the keto group. It's exactly what we see here. We see the transfer of the acetyl group to a CoA. Here we see the transfer of a succinyl to a CoA. The steps are almost identical. The structure of the enzyme is almost identical. The five coenzymes are identical. The reaction mechanism is identical. Cells are very efficient. Evolving enzymes, if you've solved the problem once, you don't always have to go resolve it again. They've done it with this enzyme and modified it slightly to use a slightly different substrate, but the same basic reaction occurs. Questions about that? OK, one last thing. Now, you guys heard those guys out there. They're noisy, all right? You are, too, when you come in here. When you come in in the section outside of the classroom, and there's a classroom in here, Whisper. Be polite. Don't speak loudly, okay? I don't want to have to come along and shush people. Thank you. All right, see you around. Yes, sir. I'm still waitlisted at number four on your molecular medicine. Is there oh, a wiggle okay. room uh, um, if we get further in, or is it a pretty hard line cap? Um, we'll have to see how many rooms, things we've got in the, in the, in the uh, section. But, but yeah, yeah, it's usually, it usually works, okay? Hi, how are you doing, Jenna? Hi. What's up? Um, I had 450 last year.